Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. A really short video here. This is a video that I'm doing primarily actually for uh, my mate Vince. Uh, the channel name is my mate Vince. MyMateVince.com. Um, yeah, he's got a very interesting channel. It's well worth checking his channel out. He's uh, done an awful lot of different types of repairs of all sorts of different consumer products, you know, uh, mostly electrical things, but you know, he's done a few mechanical fixes and things as well to various things. But uh, most recently, he's been looking at things like Nintendo Switches and Wii U's, and uh, he's got Xboxes and Playstations, and all sorts of stuff on there. But he did actually just recently look at the Mega Drive, uh, a couple of Mega Drive carts that he was trying to fix. And it was his first time going inside uh, one of these carts. Um, he, you know, he, he didn't even have to get inside it and stuff, and what you know, he had no idea what was in there. But it's well worth watching that video just to see how he got on. Um, it's always interesting to see how someone who was, not, you know, not experienced with something, just throws themselves into something to try and understand it and work uh, through various things. And he came to the conclusion it was the ROM. You know, and I was glad to see that that was the conclusion he came to at the end of the, the video. There, he tried all sorts of things. Um, so within this video, I'm going to program him up a uh, copy of Paperboy on an EEPROM. I'll get that in the post to him. But I thought it was useful to show you how I converted this, what was a faulty Sonic car, into the Club Enhanced version of Turtles Hyperstone Heist. It's got an awful label on it, I mean to redo that at some point. The other reason I'm doing this video is because I do get a lot of questions about EEPROMs in general and how they work and what size certain, what you know you should use if you want to convert one car into another etc etc and I guess there's a bit of a mystique surrounding them but they're quite simple things really, quite simple devices. I'll well, have a look at the pin out in a minute but you can see this is a mask ROM. Typically you, you know this is what you'll see uh, inside one of these carts. Uh, now they vary in size, they, you know I think you can go as small as 128k but 256k, 512k, um, 1 meg, 2 meg, uh, maybe some of the 32x ones are 4 meg, I'm not sure. But what we can do is you can swap a mask ROM with uh, an EEPROM. They use the JEDEC, um, you know, the, the Sega used the JEDEC um, standard there for the pin uh, ar arrangements. So we'll have a look at the pinout of the 27C800 next, just to show you. So here's the pinout for the 27C800. Uh, now this conforms to the JEDEC standard, that, as I say, that they use for the mask ROMs. The only difference is with this 27C800, because this is a 1 meg chip and the board we're going to look at in a sec is expecting a 512k mask ROM. Uh, we've got a couple of additional pins and they just sit at the top here. You can see A18 and not connected. If this was the 2 meg version of this uh, series of EEPROMs it would be a 27C160 and that not connected pin there would be A19 if that makes sense. Um, so what you can do is you can fit one of these in place of the mask ROM, uh, a 1 meg chip, uh, and just overhang those two pins, you know, so don't feed them through because there's no holes for them. Just lift them up, and don't feed them anywhere. Uh, and say, for instance, you were replacing a 512k game with this one meg chip, you could copy the same ROM twice so that it's in the lower half of the ROM, it's also in the upper half of the ROM. The upper half of the ROM was obviously selected by A7, uh, A18. Now, if that was floating, it wouldn't matter. What I mean is by floating is, you know, not connected to ground, not connected to VCC, just the wire just flapping in the breeze there, not connected to anything. Um, so that's the sort of technique you would use if you wanted to, let's say, put a 512k game onto one meg chip there. I mean, you could also do other clever things, like you could put a switch on A18 there and have two different games on the car. Um, it's all sort of stuff I've showed on my channel and other videos and things and talked about in the past. But I thought it, thought it was just worth you know going over it for the purpose of this video. Um, and I'll just explain some of these pins. So you've got address lines. You can see A, the ones big prefix with A, A1817 all the way down to A0. Uh, and then you've got this E. That line above it is active low, and it gets active low, and the G is active low. Now I always get confused on this type of chip because what you normally see is CS chip select and OE output enable, and I'm not sure which way around those correspond. I'd have to look at the data sheet, but uh, yeah, the chip select enables the chip, you know, to start with. I think it's kind of like powers it in a kind of waiting state. The output enable. You, you know, you pull the output enable low, so that's past a low signal. This chip can then output on its data bus, and the data bus connections on this one here are indicated uh, prefixed by a Q. So you've got Q0 all the way up to Q15 somewhere, uh, I think. Yeah, you can just see it there, Q15. So it's got Q0 to Q15, so 16 data bits, because obviously the Mega Drive is a 16-bit system. Um, th this ROM again has got something slightly different from other ROMs you'll look at. If you look at any of the sort of basic EEPROM for things like Spectrums and C64s and Amstrads and NESs and all you know those sort of systems and stuff, you won't see this byte pin here 
that's again active low and I think that you can specify that if you want to read only a byte um, at a time uh, via the 16-bit bus there instead of you know a full 16-bit word I think that's how that works again you'd have to look at the data sheet for more information it's something I've never really delved into and it's not really something you need to worry too much about actually uh, for most of these old 16 and 8-bit systems um, but that's it you know you've got your address lines and your data lines and the address lines obviously specify which block you know which word which 16-bit block you want to address in there to read out on the data bus uh, so yeah there's no rocket science or anything behind this it is really simple stuff and if you buy uh, you know a pretty cheap EEPROM programmer which will set you back about 40 50 pounds maybe 60 or 70 pounds for something decent uh, you can program most of the chips that are out there most of these EEPROMs you'll find that most of the, you know the programmers out there will, will handle a very very large number if not all uh, of the chips that are out there but sometimes you'll need an adapter um, which I'll show you in a set when we get to program it sometimes you need an adapter for different types of chips depending on what programming you've got so in order to get inside there the best way to get in there is with one of these game bit screwdrivers um, the one the size that uh, is required for a Mega Drive car like this is the same size as a PC Engine a SNES a Nintendo 64 so if you just search on eBay for you know N64 uh, screwdriver you'll find uh, this exact uh, bit here uh, you just need to get those two screws out and we should be in there there we go you can see the PCB and there's the EEPROM that I fitted uh, I'll talk about that model later so a quick tip here, uh, I've mentioned it a number of times on my channel, um, but if your desolder pump stops working you know, as well as it was doing, just clean it all out, you know, get all the bits of solder off, get all the bits of solder off the spring, uh, and this is more of a problem after you've done what I'm about to show you, you tend to have to do this every you know, number of weeks or months, depending on how much uh, use it's getting. Uh, you know, clean out the inside there as well, uh, yeah, I've had the uh, paper towel up there, uh, and then just spray a little bit of uh, WD-40 in there, which may seem counterintuitive, because it does in some ways actually uh, help the solder stick. Uh, yeah, I really need to replace this. I've got a few more uh, solder pumps actually, but you'll see if we now screw that together, the spring down, let it fire a couple of times, you hear that? It's firing so quick now, it almost wants to <laughs> break itself, hence why I've had to uh, stick some tape around there, because this thing's just on its last legs. But, that will have uh, a super amount of suction now. Sometimes uh, it's worth adding some solder, actually, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but if you're dealing with a car that's uh, got crusty old solder that's been sat there for ages, just add a little bit of solder. Uh, I actually don't need to add solder in this case, because this has been, you know, it's got the chip there that's been fit by me previously uh, just heat for a few seconds there use the desolder pump and as you can see the solder is removed and just repeat this for all the connections uh, some of them you'll have to go over a couple of different times just to make sure you've cleared all the solder but as you can see the solder on those two is uh, pretty much free there's a particle of it at the bottom there so once you've got all your pins free you can use something like this to just snap the pins off very carefully you don't want to twist them too much you'll break them but uh, yeah you can use that technique on double sided boards I wouldn't uh, necessarily always do that you know I'd double check the top side first to make sure the solder's freed up on that side as well got a bit of dirt or something between there it's a good job I went in this anywhere to get that out it's just a bit of cotton I think um, but yeah I'll just continue around that now and remove the rest of the solder so I removed the one meg EEPROM that I've been using on this uh, car here for my turtles in time. Uh, you can see one of the techniques I was uh, trying to explain to Vince is if you use captain tape or even PVC insulation tape, um, you know, to mask off, add a little bit of the chip quick flux. I'll send Vince a tube of this actually so he can uh, give it a try. Um, and just solder on the very edge. You can solder wires like that, can you see? It's got a very flat edge there. It hasn't leaked all the way down the trace. Uh, and in the right light, you can see when this is inside the Mega Drive, the contacts only come up to about two thirds of the way there, if that. So as long as you solder onto the very edges of these, you can, you know, repair damage and stuff that way. Or in my case, mod, because this is, I think, for a uh, 512k ROM chip. It originally would have had uh, Sonic or something on it. I think they had a faulty mask ROM. Um, 
so if you use a one meg chip on this one and you want to you know use the full one meg you have to use uh, add this additional wire here for the uh, additional dress line but in this case I'm, i don't need that wire i'm just gonna leave that wire floating we'll just solder the chip straight in as hopefully vince will be able to do on his and it should just work i think you know ignore that wire so the process of converting the rom file into a format that you can burn you know program to an eprom all you've got to do is take the md file um, so you can see that md file running the emulator here so i know it works i've tested it so there's the rom file and all we need to do is literally change the extension i mean you could keep the extension the same but i prefer to change it to dot bin because then it makes it easy to load into the eprom programming software so that's our binary file now the only other thing you need to do is change the endian so what i mean by that is these are uh, the, the the mega drive 16 bit so you've got two bytes uh, for each word uh, and those bytes when when they've been dumped to, uh, to a pc they've been reversed the, the the byte ordering has been swapped so before you can program this what you want to do is swap every odd and even byte within the rom you know so if you looked at say the first two bytes in there you swap them around then look at the next two swap them around then look at the next two swap them around and i've written a utility previously i'll stick a download link below so you can see the utility arrow here it's just a case of selecting the file we want to uh you know change the endian on click open it's got a destination there which is in the same folder with the same file name and it appends dash out onto the end there and if we just click go done and there we have it, there's our output file. So the Endian has been swapped, odd and even bytes swapped around. It's still the same f file size, 512K. It really is now just a case of programming that to the EEPROM. So in order to program the EEPROM here, what we need to do is load the Willem uh, software, or you know, if you're using another program, you obviously have the different software there. Select the device type, 27C800, because that's the chip we're going for. It's a one, meg, uh, one megabyte chip, you know, eight megabits. Uh, strictly speaking, Paperboy is 512K, so a 27C400 is a better choice there actually. But this chip will work fine. Uh, as you saw earlier, we just doubled up the ROM. You know, so the lower half's got a copy of the ROM and the upper half's got the co same copy of the ROM. And we can leave the upper. Uh, address bit floating it won't matter and you can see shows you the jumper positions here which correspond with the jumper positions here not all programmers are as complicated as this this is probably the most complicated but there are much much simpler uh, programmers like the GQ4X that's quite a good one and the Mini Pro I think that's uh, a pretty good program as well uh, and you often have an adapter board like you've got here for larger chips because you can see the ZIF socket on here is only something like 32 pin I think it might be a bit bigger than that um, you know so these chips are quite large chips so we'll get our 27C800 into the socket here just push it in there we go make sure everything's connected in this case I have this uh, adapter here you know to join up some of the upper dress lines and the clock and stuff load the ROM file into the buffer so there's our ROM and then we simply hit program and find the chips not blank so in order to erase this type of chip an EEPROM uh, you just need to make sure that UV uh, window here is uh, exposed and it's clean Perhaps clean this from IPA, uh, put them in somewhere like this, it's just a UV light, so there's a bulb inside that emits ultraviolet light, switch it on, uh, set the timer for about uh, 15 minutes roughly, this time is not accurate. You can see the UV there, um, and that's now erasing the chip. So after erasing those, I'm just doing a blank check, just to make sure that those are definitely 100% uh, you know, erased, then we'll try programming again. So even after blanking those two chips, I was running into some problems actually. The blank checked okay, but they just won't program. I suspect that these are just glitchy uh, 800s. Uh, I dug through my collection, I've managed to find a, an equivalent of a 27C400. So the only thing I've done is obviously change the uh, device there to a 27C400. The switches are in exactly the same position. I've still loaded the one meg uh, ROM, uh, you know, because it was doubled up, but that won't matter. It should just truncate it. So we should just get the first 512K written to that chip now but hopefully that will work i'll do a uh, verify afterwards just to make sure you know read back 
compare to what's in the buffer just to make sure that it's written correctly and then we'll stick that on my turtles in time card that I've got here um, and just give it a try before I send it out to uh, Vince So here's another example of a cheap affordable programmer. These will set you back between 20 and 30 pounds. You can see, you know, you're limited with the number of pins. Um, that is the problem with these, you know. If you get one like this, you'll probably find that you can't do some of the larger chips, like the chip I showed in this video, actually. 27C, 800 and 27C, 400. You can't program on here. I don't even think you can get an adapter for it. And you can see here with the indicators there, you know, that if your chip is smaller than the socket, you align it to the bottom. The, you know, they provide little clues there as to how uh, you connect that up. And this one, it's just a single uh, USB connected to a PC. This one is perhaps more desirable. Uh, this is quite a popular programmer, but you'll pay a little bit more for this, uh, you know, a GQ4X. I think this is a 4X4 Plus, actually. It doesn't say on it, but it is. Um, again, you're limited with the default uh, number of pins in the socket there, but you can get lots of adapters. I'll show you some of those now. So, like, this is the 16-bit adapter I'll be using uh, later to, with my Willems programmer. Uh, you can see, you know, it plugs into the programmer there, and then it provides these larger sockets and some PC, PLCC sockets as well. And then you have adapters like this. This is for the GQ4X as well, a TSOP adapter. Uh, you know, you can just push it down like that and stick a service mount TSOP chip in there as well. Uh, I've got a few of those, you know, different sizes for different chips. As you can see, I've got a, got a few back there as well for different programmers. And you can always buy cheap adapters like that. Can you see that's just a dip to, uh, you know, a, a SOP type, you know, so various chips could be soldered on there temporarily to program. Uh, and it's, you know, these programmers don't just do EPROMs, they do, uh, you know, uh, OTP chips, one time programmable, uh, you know, so you can only program them a single time. And they'll also do, do e EPROMs as well, which are electronically erasable programmable uh, read-only memories so you know you, you you've got a lot of flexibility you get some like this you've got a lot, lot of flexibility as long as you get the right adapters and things for it you can program a whole range of chips uh, for different things and this is not a bad programmer either the easy pro 90b but again it's a little bit pricey i think it's between 70 and 90 pounds and again you may need different adapters to do different uh, you know larger chips or chips with different profile other than just you know dip uh, so, and this one's got a separate power supply. Some of them, you know, aren't just powered by the USB. You need a separate power supply as well. So just getting near the end of the verify. Fingers crossed. Sweet. Yeah. Device programmed okay. So we'll solder that chip on now. I'm kind of glad that the 27C800s didn't work for me because this has got the right number of pins. The 27C800, you can see the one I was using for Turtles in Time here. It's got an extra couple of pins. Uh, now they do float, you, you just have them overhung, you know, you can cut them off. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's better because Vince can now just literally solder this chip on and hopefully his paperboy should work. So just finishing up here now, just soldering the last few connections, just add a bit of solder onto each of these, inspect and clean up. You can see I'm just using a cotton body, I will get cotton fibres all over the place, but we'll brush this in a minute as well. I'm just using this to get most of the flux off and then we'll brush some IPA around. Uh, and just test whether this works. But I mean the main purpose of this video was to show you the process really. Uh, I'm not going to show you whether Paperboy works or not, we'll have to wait until uh, Vince can test that chip on his car there. But uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. Cap of IPA, just pour some over there and give it a brush around. We'll clean the contacts up at the end. This is just to get all of that sticky flux off there. Clean the PCB edge there with a bit of IPA, make sure that's super clean and dry it off. Need to do the top side now because uh, some of the flux will have leaked through from one side to the other here. You can see with this chip here I've just got a piece of insulation tape over there masking that but uh, yeah as you'll see I'm going to stick a label on that chip before I send it to Vince. That's not too bad. So you can see with this particular one, with the Turtles in Time, I've used a larger chip. It's a one meg chip, so I've got one uh, pin there floating. It doesn't need to go anywhere. 
because I just doubled up the ROM image uh, and then I just need to reattach this wire here now to the upper address line uh, because like I said this car was originally zoned for a 512k chip and I stuck a 1 meg chip so that additional wire to the upper address bit on this uh, 1 meg chip needs to be there so we'll just reattach that, add a bit of solder on there and solder it on, that's it, job done let me give that a try now So uh, yeah, originally this, as I say, it was a faulty Sonic cart, and I just converted it to this game. It's the colour enhanced version, so the colours are subtly better than the original version of this actually. Let's just start it, make sure it's working. Sweet. So if you like repair channels like mine, you really should check out Vince's channel. Uh, I'm sure he would be the first to admit, a bit like myself, that he doesn't always get things right the first time, that he's using a bit of common sense, uh, and that's what I really uh, admire about his channel, if I'm honest. Uh, yes, he makes some mistakes, yes, there's some things where you might be, you know, if you're experienced at certain aspects, the, the things that he's looking at, you could be tearing your hair out thinking, why are you not looking at this, you know, or something obvious. It might not be obvious, and it's not obvious to people who are looking at things for the first time, but that's what I really admire about his channel, that he, you know, he dives in, he throws himself into something that he's never seen before and he's learning all the while and you're learning whilst you watch his, uh, his repairs there. Uh, and he covers all sorts of different things. I watched him fix a couple of uh, vacuum cleaners uh, just in the last week actually uh, and it made me want to rush off and get one and fix one myself if I'm completely honest. Um, that's the sort of influence he has, you know, it makes you realise that most of the stuff that you see faulty on eBay uh, can be fixed. Whether it's what I always say, really, where there's a will, there's a way. If you've got enough determination and patience and you approach things cautiously, generally you can fix anything. It's all about getting the parts and the time and experience, I guess. So, as I say, if you like my channel, check out Vince's channel. I'm sure you will love a lot of the stuff he covers. Um, thanks very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.